colloquium speaker today is Sarah Milholland, joining us from Princeton University, where she was a Sagan Fellow. Uh, before that, Sarah was at Yale during her thesis with Greg Laughlin. I believe the title was Data-Driven Dynamics of Planetary Systems. Uh, but I would argue, actually, that most of her thesis was driven by uh, physics and ingenuity with data as a guideline, which means it's even more impressive. Um, you know, she's come up with lots of brilliant ideas to explain and understand all the different features that we see in short periods of planet systems. So I think she'll walk us through some of those uh, developments today. So it should be a really exciting talk. Take it away, Sarah. All right, great. Um, thanks so much, Jim, for the introduction. And hello to everyone in the room and also on Zoom. Um, I'm going to stay pretty close and use my mouse as the pointer so that the folks on Zoom can see as well. But um, I'm really excited to be here today and have the opportunity to talk about my research, which is kind of broadly speaking, motivated by the goal of understanding the demographics and the diversity of uh, extrasolar planetary systems. So in this talk, I want to focus on the ubiquitous class of short period exoplanets. And I want to highlight a number of interesting regularities and anomalies that we see within the arrangements of their orbital, uh, orbital system. And so the goal is really to kind of understand and explain these regularities and anomalies using tools like or orbital dynamics and theory. So I think that's still one of the most remarkable discoveries in the field of exoplanets thus far is this realization that roughly half of sun-like stars are accompanied by close-in small planets with orbital periods ranging from days to months. And I'm really interested in this population of close-in planets, both because they represent such a large fraction of the systems we know about today, but also because they enable some of the best orbital and physical characterization. Uh, so this is a graphical representation of planets discovered by the Kepler mission, where the radial coordinate is the logarithmic semi-major axis. And so we can see that this population contrasts pretty sharply with our own solar system, whose inner edge is marked by Mercury's 88-day orbital period. These close-in planets also tend to be a bit larger than Earth. They're frequently in between the sizes of Earth and Neptune, as we can see by the sizes of these dots here. And lastly, um, a relatively large fraction of these planets are found in systems with more than one transiting planet, as we can see um, by the collection in this top right here. So these uh, systems of multiple transiting planets are primarily what I'm going to focus on today. These systems of multiple transient planets exhibit a lot of interesting structure and regularity. So one of the quintessential examples is the Kepler-11 system of at least six planets, uh, which was discovered back in 2011. So this system is very compact, circular, and flat. Um, so the planets are all somewhere kind of in the super-Earth to sub-Neptune size regime. And they all um, orbit inside the orbital radius of Venus, with at least the inner five having pretty uniform orbital spacing. So the system exhibits a lot of structure in the sense that there's a very low complexity. It's kind of almost as architecturally simple as you could imagine a planetary system getting. If we look at these same features of the full multi-planet population discovered by the Kepler mission, we can see that this orbital structure continues. Um, so that is, we see that the systems as a whole tend to have fairly low eccentricities and ex inclinations on average, as shown with this uh, heat map of mean eccentricity and mean inclination, where the constraints appear to be kind of pushed down to this far left corner. Um, in addition, we, the, the distribution of orbital spacing between planets in, in these multi-planet systems peaks fairly sharply at around uh, 20 mutual hill radii, which is a measure of the radius of the region that these planets gravitationally dominate. Uh, so planets have to be spaced by more than about 10 or so mutual hill radii in order to be dynamically stable. And so this um, characteristic spacing of around 20 mutual hill radii is again signaling the preponderance of these very highly structured, uh, very evenly spaced and not super complex systems. 
This structure continues beyond the orbits, though, into the physical properties of the planet. And that is that planets in the same system tend to have similar masses and radii as their neighbors. And so this intersystem uniformity uh, was first pointed out by Weiss et al. And then also in our paper from um, 2017. So this is pretty easy to see for the radii on the right. If you kind of scan your eyes down through these various systems, you can note that um, the planets, the, the radii of planets in a given system tend to be more similar to their neighbors than they would be if the systems were disassembled randomly from planets drawn from across the population. And this depiction also makes it fairly convenient to see this fairly uniform orbital spacing. On the left here, we can see this intersystem uniformity for both masses and radii, where all planets in a given system have the same color and are connected by a line. So if we measure the dispersion of planets within the same system across this mass radius plane for these observed systems, we see that they are a lot less dispersed than they would be um, if, this, if the systems were assembled randomly from planets pulled across the population. Um, so this is easiest to see if I sort of toggle back and forth between these real systems and a random permutation of the planet in which the mass and radius pairs are shuffled. So given all of this kind of really interesting regularity and structure, it kind of looks like things are fairly straightforward. Um, we see a lot of structure in both the orbital and the physical properties. But um, that's not the, the full story. The, the full story is not all that simple. And if we take a closer look, we can contrast a lot of this kind of first order structure and regularity with many kind of second order architectural anomalies. So with the word architecture, I'm referring to kind of the um, arrangements of planetary orbits and their physical properties within, within these systems. And by anomalies, I mean kind of complex deviations from this, um, this nice structure. So there are lots of examples of this, um, but I'll just point out a few here. Um, so one is that if we look at the period ratios of adjacent planets that are found in this, these, the same kind of multi-transiting system, we see that this distribution is fairly smooth overall, but that there does appear to be an overabundance wide of the one, three to two and two to one period ratios, or these are the first order mean motion resonances. Another example is that Another example of an architectural anomaly is that if we look at um, these multi transient systems, we often see that there is a extremely close in kind of outlier planet that, that appears to be kind of pulled off from the innermost edge of an otherwise fairly uniformly spaced system. Another example of an architectural anomaly is that if we look at the number of systems that host uh, just one transient planet, compared to the number of systems with two transient planets, three, or so on, we can see that there are too many uh, systems with just one transient planet, more than we expect to see based on kind of extrapolations from the multis. And finally, um, a last example of an architectural anomaly is that there's kind of this eccentricity dichotomy. Um, when we look at the eccentricities, of, of planets that in, are in single transient systems, we see that they are a lot higher than the average eccentricities in uh, systems with more than one transient planet. So I'm going to talk about a few of these today, um, but all of these sort of architectural anomalies require some explanation. And if we can uh, figure these out, we can better understand the planet formation and evolution processes that are leading to these interesting anomalies in the observation. So I would argue that uh, many, but not all of these architectural anomalies likely arise from some form of, kind of post-formational dynamical sculpting. Um, so that is evolution of the system kind of largely after its initial formation in sort of planetary disk. And such post-formation dynamics includes things like resonance interactions between planets, um, planet planetite scattering, tidal interactions between the planets and their host stars, 
um, irradiation-driven effects from the stars, or giant impacts and collisions, and so on. And so for much of today's talk, I want to focus on the importance of these tidal interactions for sculpting the architectures of these short period planets. So tides are particularly important for short period planets because of the very steep inverse distance dependence. Uh, so the magnitude of the tidal force goes as one over distance cubed. And so this leads to a significant distortion in the direction of the host star for a very close in planet. Um, so whenever this kind of tidal bulge is forced to shift due to orbital or rotational motion, this can lead to significant interior energy dissipation or tidal heating inside of the planet. And in the kind of equilibrium tide model, which is one of the simplest models of, um, of tides that we have, the rate at um, which this the rate at which this thermal energy is dissipated in the planet from its orbital energy is given by some, an expression that looks something like this, where E is the eccentricity of the orbit of the planet, and epsilon is the obliquity or the axial tilt of the spin axis of the planet from its orbital axis. So um, this plot is showing the tidal luminosity as a function of this uh, the semi-major axis of the planet, and its tidal quality factor, or a measure of how dissipative the planet is. And these contours are showing ratios of this tidal luminosity with respect to the incident stellar power. So we can see that for very close in planets, the tidal luminosity can be in excess of about 1% of the incident stellar power. This plot though is just using kind of fixed values of the eccentricity and the obliquity of the planet. So in order to kind of talk more about the origin and dependence of these eccentricity and obliquity components to the tidal luminosity, it's, it's kind of helpful to put this into a broader framework that we might be a little bit more familiar with. So to do that, it's helpful to talk about one of the best examples of tidal heating that we have in our own solar system. And so this is Io, the closest of Jupiter's Galilean satellite. And it's the most geologically active body in our solar system due to the really amounts, the immense amounts of tidal heating that it experiences. So Io has such strong tides because it is locked in a resonance with neighboring satellites that keep its orbit fixed with a non-zero eccentricity. This elliptical orbit means that there are continual changes in the strength and in the direction of the tidal force um, that, that Jupiter uh, causes Io to feel. And so this kind of stretches and squishes Io's interior and leads to a strong amount of interior friction and heat deposition. In, addi in addition to these eccentricity that tides, though, you can also have what are called obliquity tides. So imagine now that Io's orbit is circular, but that its spin axis was tilted off of its orbital axis. So in this case, the orientation of the tidal bulge that Jupiter raises on Io changes with respect to its equator every orbit. And so the tidal ball is sort of sweeping across Io's surface every orbit and leading to similar stresses and strains in its interior. So both these eccentricity tides and obliquity tides um, contribute strongly to tidal heating. And so here's a look at the, the normalized tidal luminosity in these two dimensions, eccentricity and obliquity. So earlier on, I mentioned that these close-in multi-transiting systems generally have pretty low eccentricities. And so that means that in this regime, these obliquity tides can be a several orders of magnitude stronger effect than the eccentricity tides. And so in this talk, I want to largely focus on the role that the, these non-zero obliquities might play. So for the next um, couple sections of the talk, I want to propose that these tidal interactions and particularly these obli the obliquity tides might naturally explain some of, several of these architectural anomalies that we see among these close-in planets. And today I want to discuss two specific examples. So the first topic I want to focus on are the so-called um, ultra-short period planets. The primary question that we're trying to look at here is, 
uh, why do we see some planets that have very extreme proximity to their host stars? Extremely close in planets are particularly peculiar when we think about the fact that these planets have to form in disks and they shouldn't be able to form inside their inner edges of their disk, which are thought to be controlled by uh, magnetic truncation and are roughly around a, a few day orbital period. Um, however, we do see planets that are inside of one day orbital periods, um, sometimes down to only a few stellar radii, um, as we can see in this occurrence rate plot um, here. And so this population of planets with orbital periods inside of one day are called the ultra short period planets or the USPs. Um, so these USPs are pretty rare. They only occur around 1% of sunlight stars. And they are almost always pretty small, rocky planets with sizes less than about two Earth radii. So it's generally agreed in, in the field that these USPs cannot have formed where they're currently found due to this issue that I mentioned above. And so that they must have formed further out and migrated to their current location. So the question is, how did that process happen? In trying to solve this um, puzzle, we can examine some of the observational characteristics that we see in the systems that host uh, USP. So this plot is showing um, a large collection of USPs that are found in multi-transiting systems. And so we notice that they um, frequently have um, multiple close-in kind of co-transiting companion planets. We also notice another kind of key feature of these these orbits, and that is that the USPs tend to have larger period ratios with respect to their nearest neighbors that are typically a lot larger than the um, average period ratios that we see among these close in systems. So this is an indication then that um, these planets, these USPs, might start out at the kind of inner edge of, of an otherwise fairly typical closely spaced multi-transiting system before then kind of moving inwards. So these observational properties are then kind of pointing towards a formation channel via um, orbital decay driven by tidal dissipation. And so as I discussed earlier, um, one way that um, tides from the star can lead to dissipation inside the planet is if there is a planetary obliquity or a angle between the planet's spin axis and its orbital axis. And one way to maintain uh, a non-zero obliquity in the face of tidal dissipation is with a configuration called a Cassini state, um, which I'll describe in more detail soon. So here I want to kind of talk about this new theory for the production of these USPs from the innermost edge of a kind of otherwise fairly typical multi-planet um, multi system. And so we've named this um, obliquity-driven tidal runaway. So the process can be described in three component steps that I'll go through in, in more detail. And the first is a kind of entry or capture of the planet obliquity into these Cassini states um, with enhanced, um, enhanced obliquity. So to illustrate how this works, um, consider just having kind of a two planet system with a slight neutral inclination between the two planets orbits. Um, so we want to understand how the obliquities of the planets behave when they're kind of embedded in this kind of orbital configuration. So due to secular or kind of long-term average interactions between the two planets orbits, both planets are undergoing um, mutual kind of orbital precession. So these um, orbital angular momentum vectors are processing around the total angular momentum vectors. And the rate of this orbital precession, we can label with the frequency G, which uh, just depends on kind of in a low, low eccentricity, low inclination regime, just depends on the masses and the semi-major axes of the two planets. In addition, um, torques from the star onto the planets themselves cause their spin axes to process around their respective orbit normals. And so the frequency of this spin axis precession, we can label with alpha. So it is the comparison of these two frequencies, G and alpha, that dictate the resulting um, dynamics. 
So in this uh, kind of processing orbit frame, Cassini states are the, the positions, the equilibrium positions of the planet spin vectors. So that is, they are the position where the spin vector is fixed in this processing orbit frame. And so this condition can be written with an expression that looks something like this, where G and alpha are those frequencies I just defined. Epsilon is the planetary obliquity or axial tilt, and I is related to the orbital inclination. So there are up to four different um, kind of Cassini equilibrium states um, that satisfy this criterion. And they depend on this ratio of G over alpha, the ratio of the orbital precession frequency to the spin axis precession frequency. In the presence of tidal dissipation though, only states one and states two are the only stable states. And so this right panel here is a closer look at these two states um, for different values of the inclination as I'm shown with these different kind of opacity lines. So the, the key idea then is that for these close-in planets, tidal dissipation will rapidly force the planetary equity to equilibrate in either state one or state two. And so if this ratio of G over alpha is out here kind of beyond unity, then state two is the only state that the planet can occupy. And so the planet, um, the obliquity gets forced to be non-zero by at least the amount of the orbital inclination. This forced obliquity then um, leads, to, leads to dissipation in the planet, and that dissipation leads its orbit to decay, to shrink a little. And this orbital decay actually decreases this ratio of G over alpha, which then further increases the obliquity. And so this kind of begins kind of this runaway process. So just to reiterate then, the key idea is that the, the tidally relaxed kind of equilibrium position of the obliquities um, are non-zero. And this means that kind of sustained obliquity driven tidal dissipation becomes inevitable. Um, so as I've already alluded to then, once this obliquity is in this non-zero state, tidal dissipation will lead the orbit to shrink. Um, and the rate of this orbital decay induced by tidal dissipation can be calculated in kind of an, an equilibrium tides framework. So for some kind of typical planetary properties here, I'm showing the, de the decay time scale as a function of the orbital period and the planet's obliquity. So the key point to kind of take away is that if the planet starts out with a small enough initial orbital period, and an enhanced obliquity, then it will decay to kind of even shorter periods where the rate of decay is even faster. So this begins kind of a runaway orbital decay process. Finally, for this last part though, this wouldn't, this wouldn't, work, um, this wouldn't work if the orbital decay continued at a runaway rate indefinitely, since then the planet would crash into the star and we wouldn't see them today. So something has to stall the orbital decay and this process is called um, Cassini state breaking. So Cassini state breaking is kind of essentially the limit at which the tides become too strong to maintain a high obliquity. So as the orbit decays and the obliquity moves up this Cassini state two branch, eventually it becomes um, too large to be stable to tidal dissipation and kind of breaks out of this state and goes down to um, state one, so a much smaller obliquity. So on the right here, I'm showing um, kind of examples of this runaway orbital decay, um, where I'm kind of starting with different initial orbital periods, and the color bar is the obliquity. So the decay reaches a uh, the decay reaches a runaway rate at some point, at which point the obliquity rapidly gets forced to be very large, um, but it becomes too large to be stable and kind of pops out of that state and goes back down to state one, at which point the orbital decay stops. And so because this kind of decay process happens so um, fast, we're not very likely to see this happening in real time. Um, but there is one kind of example of a, of a system that might cur currently be undergoing this runaway orbital decay. 
And that could be kind of confirmed with some follow-up observations. Um, so as far as testing this theory of USP production with further observations, there are a couple of um, things that could potentially be done. So first would be to try to obtain some better constraints on the eccentricities of the companion planets in the USP system. And this could help kind of rule out um, that eccentricity tides have contributed strongly to the, the tidal migration. Um, second, um, I didn't get a chance to talk about this in detail, but a prediction of our work is that the UST orbits will tend to end up fairly aligned with the stellar uh, spin axis, um, whereas the companion planet orbits will are a little bit misaligned. Um, so future observations of the stellar obliquity, which is this angle between the stellar spin axis and the orbital axis of the planet, um, could help test this um, test this hypothesis. And both of these tests will become more available with the test mission as it continues to discover these ultra short period planets around brighter stars. Okay, um, so moving on to the next topic now. Um, so just as this the, the problem with the ultra short period planets kind of stemmed from some anomalies that we see in the distribution of orbital periods of close in planets. But we also see some anomalies kind of in the distribution of the orbital period ratio of multiple planet systems. So this problem here is concerning this um, period ratio distribution, which is shown here for um, Kepler system. So the x-axis here is the ratio of the orbital period of an outer planet to an inner planet for pairs of planets that are drawn from the same system. And a feature that has been noticed as kind of as statistically significant for some time is that there is this excess of period ratios that appear to be wide of the first order um, resonances, so the three to two and two to one in particular. Um, so these are called the first order mean motion resonances. Um, it's a little bit hard to see here, but if we Kind of zoom in near this exact two to one ratio, we can see that there's this excess just wide of the two to one and this deficit inside. So these um, mean motion resonances or MMRs um, are naturally produced, um, they're interesting because they're naturally produced through convergent migration of planets while they're still embedded in the protoplanetary disk. So essentially, um, these kind of planet disk torques can lead the, the orbits of the planets to migrate. And if this proceeds convergently between um, two planetary orbits, then they can get kind of um, locked into these, these special configurations, um, such as this kind of simulation on the right showing a capture into a three to two orbital period ratio. And they can kind of stay captured in this even as the planets continue migrating. So several authors have shown that if planets first get captured into kind of exact um, mean motion resonances through migration of planets in the disk, and then subsequently they undergo some form of dissipative evolution, um, such as dissipation due to tides, then this will cause systems to move wide of the exact resonances in the direction of the offset that we see. Um, however, these authors have found that there would have to be kind of a, um, if we're like working with eccentricity tides alone, then there would have to be a significant source of extra dissipation. Or in other words, that um, the planets are, are not dissipative enough to move by the move far of the period ratios by the amount that we see. Um, so we're in need of some kind of source of extra dissipation that is a, um, a couple orders of magnitude effect. And so in, in this um, study from 2019, we showed that if we can account for kind of extra dissipation that we would expect to be coming from um, obliquity tides, then this can be sufficient dissipation to move planets wide of the exact resonances by the amount that we see. However, though this solution requires that these planets are frequently found with non-negligible obliquities. 
Uh, so what is there to suggest that they actually uh, do have these non-zero tilts? Um, well, it's, it's not just that the planet can, just can have these high obliquities, but we actually kind of expect them to um, due to a dynamical resonance called a, a secular spin orbit resonance. Um, so the key idea is in realizing that these high obliquity uh, Cassini states can be generated in multiple ways. Um, so one way, is, as, as I was showing earlier, as if, the, is if this um, ratio of G over alpha, the orbital to the spin axis to session frequencies, um, evolves through something like orbital decay, as I was showing for the USPs. Um, but another way is if this G over alpha frequency ratio evolves through means other than uh, than orbital decay, so, such as other evolutionary factors going on early on in the system's lifetime. And so we call this mechanism resonant excitation, essentially because these G and alpha frequencies can evolve and become commensurable with one another. Um, so uh, this, is, this is called a secular spin orbit resonance. And this mechanism actually isn't new. This is the, um, um, it's actually present in our own solar system. And namely, this is the mechanism that is thought to give rise to Saturn's 27 degree obliquity due to resonant perturbation that it experiences from Neptune. So just to reiterate then, kind of if these planets start out with a, a G over alpha ratio that's sort of out here, and then um, if this G over alpha ratio evolves, then they can get kind of naturally resonantly excited to um, higher obliquities. And so we showed that these close in kind of Kepler multi-transiting systems are highly susceptible to this obliquity exciting resonance. And that is because it just so happens that the typical orbital precession frequencies that I'm showing with this blue histogram tend to have very similar values to the spin axis precession frequencies that I'm showing with these dashed histograms. So therefore, as these systems are kind of encountering these resonances while the G and alpha frequencies evolve um, early on, they can, they can evolve into these secular spin orbit resonant encounters that kind of pump these large planet obliquities. So this has been kind of a qualitative discussion of this so far. So to, get, to give you a better sense of, kind of how this works and how these planets can evolve into these um, high obliquity states, I'm going to show an example simulation um, showing what happens to kind of a typical young planetary system as it evolves and encounters these resonances. Um, so I'm going to start out with just a star and two planet system with all bodies endowed with structure, meaning that um, I'm not just accounting for them as point masses, but accounting for some of their physical extent. And then the, 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 the thing is that in order to get into these mean motion resonances in the first place, the planets have to migrate at least a little bit in the disk. And so I'm going to start out the system um, that's a, a little bit wide of a three to two mean motion resonance and just migrate the planets a little bit so that they encounter this resonance. And then finally, in addition to kind of the standard Newtonian kind of point mass acceleration, I'll also account for the um, tidal and spin evolution of, of the planet. All right, so this orbital migration um, through the disk is what can change the orbital and the spin precession frequencies and cause them to enter these high obliquity states. And so th this top plot is showing the obliquities as a function of time, and the bottom plot is showing some of the periods of precession as a function of time. So if we focus on this bottom plot first and note at, look at the blue and the green curves, um, these are the um, periods of precession of the spin axes of the inner and outer um, planets. And then the purple curve is the period of the orbital precession of the planets, which is the same for both of these, both planets in, in, in the system. So we can see that um, the inner planet first encounters this resonance here, at which point the obliquity gets kind of impulsively kicked to around 30 degrees. 
Um, later on, though, the resonance can only be captured in one direction versus the other. So later on, it, it actually gets captured into this resonance at which point its spin axis precession period gets forced to equal its orbital precession period. And the obliquity gets resonantly excited to around 50 degrees or so. Um, and so the, the frequencies of precession kind of stop evolving once um, kind of the migration and the spin down stops um, evolving. And so the obliquity gets kind of indefinitely captured into this um, high obliquity state. And so it will be experiencing these strong tidal dissipation in this state for very long time scales, um, as long as it maintains this kind of this resonant configuration. Um, so this example simulation is just demonstrating what we expect to be happening for at least kind of some subset of these systems that are found near these mean motion resonances. There are though some in interesting kind of additional layers to this problem. And that is that because of some of the details of the dynamics that occur near these mean motion resonances, our hypothesis predicts that um, the obliquities of the planets that are found slightly wider resonance tend to be a little bit larger on average than the obliquities that are um, slightly inside of the resonance. Now though, if these planets are experiencing a lot stronger tides due to their enhanced obliquities, then we should expect that this intensified, um, this intensified uh, heat deposition um, in the interior of the planet could kind of puff up any amount of atmosphere that these planets have. So then we might expect to see larger radii of the planets that are wider resonance compared to those just inside. So to examine this kind of hypothesis of whether these planets wider resonance do indeed have kind of larger average radii, we can look at how the planetary radii compare across the entire period ratio distribution. Um, so here's the period ratio distribution again, just very coarsely dimmed into bins of width 0.05. And we can look at kind of adjacent bins pulled from this period ratio distribution. Um, so here is a kind of a and an uh, example of just two randomly selected adjacent bins. And so we want to look at the mean of the planet radius that appears in a given period ratio bin and see how it compares to the mean planet radius in a period ratio bin that's just adjacent to it. Um, so here's the mathematical representation of what I just said, the mean radius here compared to the mean radius here. And then we want to kind of run that calculation across the entire um, period ratio distribution. So here is the result of that calculation where on the y-axis is the ratio of the mean radii across a given period ratio plotted vers versus the period ratio. And so the, the purple circles here are indicating all spots where this, this um, quantity is greater than two sigma enhanced over unity. And so we can see that the, the only places that this happens at are indeed at the three to two and two to one uh, mean motion resonances. So um, the kind of takeaway then is that we do see kind of this, this um, kind of intriguing um, evidence then that these planets that are observed to be wide of these mean motion resonances appear to have larger average radii. With this observation then of these larger average radii for the planets that are wider resonance that we kind of expected to have larger obliquities, we can kind of turn to examine the question of whether the obliquity tide hypothesis offers a consistent explanation. Um, so using some 1D interior structure models that um, I don't have time to discuss the details of, um, we found that this radius inflation that we expect to see from tidal heating associated with obliquity tides could potentially explain these, these anomalously large radii. Um, so here on the right, I'm showing a plot of the um, tidal inflation of a kind of a collection of a Monte Carlo collection of simulated planets. And so on the y-axis, I'm showing the ratio of the radius in the case where we kind of turn tides on, where we account for the effects of tides 
um, with respect as a ratio with respect to the radius of the planet in the tides free space. And so I'm plotting this as a function of the ratio of the tidal luminosity with respect to the incident stellar power. So we can see that um, when these tides become strong enough, um, greater than about 10 to the negative five times the incident stellar power, then the, the tidal heating can pretty substantially affect the overall planet radius. Um, so it can kind of puff them up to about twice um, twice their size without, without accounting for tides. Um, so this kind of demonstrates uh, heuristically that these tidal heating could indeed be a possible explanation for these observed radius distribution features. But I think we kind of just did the first order um, look at this problem so far. So there's more to see here in terms of how it interacts with um, other observables such as atmospheric mass loss and other um, extensions of that. So I'd like to kind of transition now away from um, tidal effects um, and focus on some other dynamical processes that occur among these short period planets. But before doing that, I want to talk just a little bit about how we can test these tidal theories. So as far as um, obliquity tides, um, one of the things that you would want to do would be to try to observe these planetary obliquities directly. Um, so this is still very challenging to do, but there are some techniques that could prove fruitful with um, um, future kind of um, observational techniques down the line. So I think the most uh, promising technique for JWST will be in trying to measure um, deviations of the um, planet's transit light curve from what you would expect to see from a, a, the transit of a spherical planet. And so that is if we try to fit the um, transit light curve data of a kind of oblate like squash planet with a spherical planet transit model, we will see residuals um, from that transit that, that look something like this that are concentrated at the ingress and egress phases of the transit. Um, and so this um, signal is sensitive to both the oblateness of the planet as well as the planetary obliquity. So another proposed technique for measuring the obliquity is something called secondary eclipse mapping, which is a, a process of creating a brightness map of the planet based on the shape of the occultation of the planet as it process, kind of passes behind the host star. And so this has been shown to both be doable with JWST and also potentially sensitive to these um, planetary obliquities. And finally, for um, directly imaged planets, which is kind of in a different regime from these very close in planets, but um, a combination of spectroscopic and astrometric um, uh, measurements can be kind of put together to, um, to measure the obliquity of directly imaged planets. Um, and this was done for the first time successfully by um, Brian et al. in 2020. Um, so in short, there seems to be kind of some promising um, methods for obtaining some more direct constraints of planetary obliquities going into the future. And one of the areas also that I'm really excited about is that the, the tidal heating can actually exhibit signatures in atmospheric spectroscopy. And so this occurs because tidal heating changes, um, changes the temperature of the very deep interior of the planet. And this can there, thereby change the atmospheric chemistry kind of further up in the observable part of the atmosphere. Um, so this is, these effects have just begun to be kind of explored in the literature, but I think it's an exciting frontier for JWST with the incredible sector that we kind of hope to be receiving from it and will allow us to kind of greatly explore the connections between kind of the orbital dynamics and tidal effects and kind of the atmospheric uh, measurements. Okay, so transitioning now to the kind of final short um, section of the talk. Um, I want to move away from kind of tidal effects on short period planets and think about another um, last kind of architectural anomaly known as the overabundance of single transiting systems or the Kepler dichotomy. So to set the stage for this, I'll, I'll note that in the talk so far, I've focused a lot on 
this group of transiting multiple um, planet systems. So that is the systems where we see um, two or more planets that transit the same star. But um, really these transiting multis are really just kind of a subset of the larger group of close in multi-planet systems that include systems where not all planets transit the star. And so for instance, an example of a multi-transiting system might um, might inherently have four planets in the system, but maybe only three of them are transiting. An example of a, of a system outside of this group might inherently have three planets in the system, but where only one of those planets is transiting. So what can we learn about the underlying distribution of these um, close-in multi-planet systems? So one thing that's particularly interesting to um, explore is the distribution of mutual orbital inclinations. So that we know that the solar system um, is pretty coplanar; it has pretty small um, mutual orbital inclinations between the planets. And we also know that these transiting multis are also pretty coplanar, with just a few degrees of mutual orbital inclination. But we, however, we kind of don't have great constraints so far on the, um, the, the mutual inclinations of planets outside of this group. And we don't really know whether they also tend to, have, tend to be pretty coplanar like all of these others. Um, so uh, these, the, it is our goal with this to try to better understand the distribution of mutual orbital inclinations of these all the kind of the population of all close and multis. And this has really kind of interesting implications for understanding the planet formation processes of these um, of these closing systems. So we can find clues about the underlying distribution of mutual orbital inclination by looking at what is called the observed transiting multiplicity distribution. Um, so this is um, this distribution is reflects the number of stars that we see with just a single transiting planet compared to two, three, or four, and so on. So this distribution shows that there's an apparent excess of systems with just one transiting planet um, compared to the number of singles that we would expect to see based on kind of extrapolations from the one to two degree mutual inclination dispersion of the transit multis. And so this discrepancy is another example of one of these architectural anomalies and it's known as the Kepler dichotomy. So the, the leading interpretation of this Kepler dichotomy is that it is signaling the existence of a kind of a subpopulation of systems that have larger mutual inclinations. So for instance, there might be two subpopulations, one with just a few degree mutual inclination and one with kind of tens of degrees of mutual inclination. Alternatively though, a smooth and sort of broad distribution of mutual inclinations can also fit this data. And so the fundamentally the issue is that there is a this degeneracy between the intrinsic multiplicity, the number of planets in the system, and the inclination. And this degeneracy affects how many planets we observe to transit in the system. And that makes it difficult to constrain the underlying distribution of mutual inclination. So in this um, recent work, we looked at um, using transit duration variations or TDD in the Kepler planet population to kind of break this degeneracy um, and better constrain the mutual inclination distribution of these close in multi-planet systems. So TDDs can arise when the transiting planet's um, transit cord is drifting across the stellar surface um, due to orbital precession induced by quarks from perturbing planets, which may be non-transiting um, kind of as depicted here. So for a transiting planet, then this orbital precession will lead to long-term changes in the transit duration that manifest as an oscillation over kind of thousands of years. Um, but for this um, kind of a four-year baseline, which is what's observed for the Kepler mission, this will kind of manifest just as a simple linear trend. These transit duration drifts were detected for roughly two dozen of um, these Kepler planets. 
And so the typical signals show a time, um, time derivative of the transit duration on the order of about one to 10 minutes per year. So examples of these detections are shown for the Kepler-9 system on, on the left here. So the key thing is that the, this GDB signal is sensitive to the uh, mutual inclination between the planet's orbit. And as, as such, the, this can be used to constrain the underlying distribution of these mutual inclinations. So the key idea and goal of this analysis was to compare the observed distribution of um, TDB detection from Kepler to expectations from what we would expect to see from simulated planet populations that were subject to different assumptions about the mutual inclination. Um, so just very briefly, we, we considered um, simulated planet populations developed from this kind of empirically calibrated forward modeling framework that has been calibrated to fit a large range of um, kind of Kepler planet population observables. And so we considered two variations of these population models. Um, the first one, um, which is called the two Rayleigh model, uh, was kind of this dichotomous distribution of mutual inclination. And then another one, um, the kind of, which is called the maximum AMD model, um, which is more of the smooth and broad, fairly low inclination distribution. So after generating these simulated pop planet populations using each model, we simulated the TDB detection process to see if kind of which planets would have measurable TDBs if they had been observed with the Kepler mission. Um, so uh, kind of wrapping up now, this is um, our main result from that. And these histograms are showing the number of planets that we would expect to see with detectable transit duration variations according to 100 different realizations of these planet population models. So essentially each value in the histogram corresponds to an expected number of TDB detections across a whole Kepler planet population. And the dashed line is showing the number that we got from the observations from Kepler. So we can see that the maximum AMD model yields a quantity of planets with detected TDBs that is in good agreement with the observations. Whereas in contrast, this dichotomous um, kind of two Rayleigh model over predicts the number of planets with detected TDBs because it has so many higher inclination systems. And those higher inclinations tend to drive some larger TDBs overall. So given these results, our key takeaway from this is that we are presenting evidence for kind of more of a Kepler continuum rather than a Kepler dichotomy. Or in other words, the TDB statistics appear to support more of a continuous distribution of somewhat lower mutual inclinations and do not really support um, a dichotomous model with many high inclination systems. Okay, um, so to sum up now, um, these close-in systems have a lot of interesting structure and regularity, but they also present some interesting anomalies. And uh, the dynamics of things like um, obliquity tides can help explain some of these anomalies that we see in things such as the ultra-short period planet population, as well as these overabundances wide of resonances. And then other dynamics, such as those of long-term orbital precession from TDBs, can help us constrain the kind of population features of, of this distribution. Um, and this is kind of closely linked to formation processes that sculpt these systems. And so going forward, it will be interesting to keep examining these short period planet populations and continue to examine the regularities and anomalies that um, kind of pop out of the data. So uh, thanks so much for your attention. I'll take any questions you have. All right, we have time for a few questions. Well, right. uh, yeah, I have a question about the question about the various uh, uh, So, from the ones that you observe multiple transiting planets, you said that you only see like one or two percent information. Like, would that agree with this uh, broader distribution, or like is that just you cannot see high information? So I'm just asking, you know, is it okay for a broader distribution but not see that in the in the Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um 
I hope the folks on Zoom heard that. Should I repeat the question? Or... Yeah, that would be nice. Okay. Um, the question was like, I talked about how the multi the systems where you have more than one transient planet, um, our constraints have inclination mutual inclinations of around one to two degrees. So, is that consistent with kind of this um, broader population? And so the thing about that's interesting about this um, maximum AMD model is that it is multiplicity dependent. So the more planets in the system, the lower mutual inclination, the mu lower mutual inclination dispersion. So high multiplicity systems have lower mutual inclinations, and that was motivated by kind of stability considerations. Um, and so it kind of when you put it all together, it creates systems that both have a lot of kind of transiting planets with very cool planet orbits. And then some like two or three um, planet systems that have a little bit larger inclination, some are like five or up to 10 degrees. Okay, I like the idea of liquidity tides as an inflation mechanism, just wider resonance. But it seems like you can add just a factor of a few more times the energy, which might come from a higher Q factor, and you can drive the atmosphere completely away. So I wonder if you could talk about how close to a, to a razor's edge that is. And yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And the, um, well, so the question was about how the tidal inflation um, can, if you, if you extended it just a little bit further, you might imagine that not only would it inflate the planet's atmospheres, but it would lead to kind of complete evaporation. And so the question is kind of how close are you to that? Um, so that's something that I think it, um, I haven't explored greatly so far, but I, I saw preliminarily in these Monte Carlo simulations that sometimes when you turn tidal heating on, um, it does lead to atmospheric um, mass loss that can completely strip the atmosphere in some cases where it hadn't been stripped when tides were turned off for everything else being equal. So I think there is kind of a subset of, of planets that might have like be sculpted by that, but we haven't done kind of a full parameter study of it. But we do know that, you know, not all of our Monte Carlo simulations lost their atmosphere. So it seems to be kind of a, I don't know, a few percent um, effect, um, like a few percent of the planets were affected by that in that way, but we should look at it in a more depth, in more in-depth way. So just as a quick follow-up, that would also increase the dispersion in planet size because some planets get bigger and others would get smaller if they're atmospheric off. Right, yeah. So if you said that um that might increase the dispersion in planet sizes because some um might loot inflate their atmospheres while some might lose them. And yeah, that's a uh that's a great point. And I think like overall it, it seems like if this is you know, if we if we take the mean radius of these planets that are affected by this, it seems to drive them larger overall. But yeah, if we look at the overall dispersion, we might see some kind of indi indicators of that. Okay, one more. Um, so you mentioned the UPS is at a current rate of about one percent. Um, and how does that square with the like fifty percent current rate of short period times? Right, yeah. So the thing with oh yeah, sorry. Um, so the question was about why these obliquity tides. Um, so ultra short period planets are found only around one percent of sun-like stars, whereas these close in multis um, are pretty prevalent. So why do the obliquity tides or why aren't they affected for all these systems? So the thing is, is that you need a couple things to kind of work well in order to create the USP. So first enough, first off, you need to start close enough to the star already that the amount of tidal the orbital decay that they start to feel becomes significant to kind of fully pull their orbit a little, their orbit in. You also um, you just kind of need the the orbital kind of frequencies to work out such that you enter this this Cassini state. So in some cases it might enter Cassini state one, which is a much smaller obliquity rather than Cassini state two. So in the paper, we kind of mapped out the parameter space that we see this in. And it does kind of, it is kind of like a narrow parameter space, which makes it um, kind of square with the fact that this is 
these are a pretty rare phenomenon and not happening in every single multi transiting system. All right, we're, we're a couple of minutes over time, so I think we'll leave it there. Let's thank Sarah again. Yeah, I've been there.